Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. Today I am doing a full Falcon Heavy simulation to see how much mass we can get to orbit in a fully reusable configuration. Now, I did manage to track down this little piece of video from the International Astronautical Congress in Adelaide, Australia in 2017. There's a link to this full video in the description, but basically Elon Musk here is saying that the Falcon Heavy should be able to get 30 tonnes of payload to orbit. Now, rather than just sending a mass simulator to orbit, I thought I'd make a little vessel here which is capable of getting all the way to the moon and land with a little bit of a payload here which is going to incorporate a whole bunch of food and water uh, as a bit of an emergency supply for future astronauts to the moon. You'll see on the top of this vessel we have these eight hex cans sort of arranged around, uh, just spaced nice and evenly. Each one of these holds around 150 kilograms of either food or water there, the H2O. And uh, yes, this could sustain a human life for quite some time in an emergency situation. Along with this, we have some very large solar arrays as well as a very big communication dish here, much bigger than what we need so that we can communicate back to Earth. So yes, if you're watching this in full quality, you should be able to see the vessel stats down the bottom. We have just over 30 tons uh, here for this vessel. And what we're going to do is mount this inside the uh, Falcon Heavy fairing. Now, uh, it does look a little odd. I've had to make uh, the vessel quite wide just so that it's going to fit inside the Falcon Heavy fairing. But of course, I also wanted to build a vessel that could actually get to the moon and also uh, be exactly that 30 ton mass. So without further ado, let's start this simulation. See if we can in fact get that full payload to orbit as well as still land all three of our boosters. Now for those of you that have not yet seen the previous video I did where we actually did launch the Tesla Roadster, you can check that out from the top right here. Uh, very cool mission actually, I was able to find some great mods to simulate that Tesla Roadster really well, so check that out. Now as in real life, the central core will throttle itself right down here to its minimum thrust level as it passes around 200 meters per second. So that's just occurred here. And you'll see there from the fuel stats over in the bottom left of the screen that the fuel will now drain more slowly out of that central core. Now I'm simulating this Falcon Heavy launch here with Kerbal Space Program. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with Kerbal Space Program, it's a great little game slash simulation, whatever you'd like to call it, and it lets us do all sorts of really amazing simulations of this nature. The one thing I will say, though, is it is not easy to be able to do this. Uh, what I've actually done to be able to land the boosters, which you will see here soon, uh, is basically program scripts to control the boosters and actually get the trajectories just right to come in for those awesome landings. Now, around 20 seconds ago in the launch would have been around the time we passed max Q, which is the maximum dynamic pressure experienced by the vessel as it punches up through the atmosphere. After the atmosphere thins out, of course, that pressure drops and the vessel can throttle back up. Now, in this simulation, I was unable to get the exact same velocity that uh, we saw from the real Falcon Heavy launch pushing the Tesla Roadster up into orbit. And that's essentially because we are pushing 30 tons here instead of only around two or three or whatever the Tesla Roadster would have been. That being said, I have left myself zero fuel left. By the time we come down to touchdown, we have got nothing. We've just got fumes. Just coming up here to boost the engine cutoff, there they both go to attach while the central core keeps thrusting forward. And I can pull the footage there up in the top left so we can actually watch the boost back burns. And you can really get a feeling there of the uh, amount of power these have got when they're basically just empty containers with just a tiny bit of fuel left for landing. With the three engines at full thrust here, we can get right up to around 9G of acceleration, which is, uh, which is pretty incredible actually. Uh, considering it's only the three engines on. And just before we get to the correct impact point, we switch both the outside engines off, throttle the central core engine right down just to get the impact point as precise as we can. And at the same time we have main engine cut off, we have stage two thrusting out there, leaving the core to fall back down to do its boost back burn towards the drone ship. And seeing as we've now left the atmosphere, we can release those fairings, letting them fall gracefully away as well. 
The central core now, of course, is throttling right up to decelerate enough before it hits the top of the atmosphere in a big ball of flame. So uh, you'll see here we are actually using all nine engines and throttling down right there at the end, just using minimum thrust on that one central core engine. And that has our impact point just about perfect. Stage 2 is in the process of a long burn to orbit here, so we'll switch the main footage to the booster landings. The entry burns have started reducing our velocity right down to around 1,000 meters per second. Engine cut off there, and our grid fins and the actual body of the booster should now do most of the work to steer the booster right over the launch pad as it comes down. Now because we have almost no fuel margin, we need to do a perfect suicide burn, the hover slam SpaceX calls it, so as we get right down close to touchdown, all three engines will fire on for just a few seconds and then switch into that central core engine just to touch down nice and gently. Come on, stick those two boosters, one and two, it just ran out of fuel just above the launch pad there. Uh, that uh, that was actually quite lucky that the uh, the landing legs took that impact. So there we go. I was not going to get one more second of burn time out of those engines before they were completely out of fuel. Now the central core here is in the same sort of scenario. I've pushed this core to the limit as well. We're kicking off our re-entry burn here as we pass 50 kilometers in altitude. Three engine burn here again just to reduce that velocity down under 1,000 meters per second. Then we're going to cut those engines and uh, let our grid fins and the body steer ourselves down over the top of our drone ship. I have actually done a lot of coding around the grid fin control system since the last video. So you'll see that the vessel uh, uses the entire body to reduce its velocity, its horizontal velocity more than anything, to bring itself down right over the target, whether it be the drone ship or the launch pad. You can see the velocity dropping a lot just from the drag as we enter the atmosphere and only a few second burn here again with the three engines dropping back to the one engine just to touch down and there we go on the drone ship right in the center. How about that? And with again no fuel margin left to spare. So I pushed those boosters to the limit. Now the stage 2 footage has been running this entire time. We are just coming up to our time to apoapsis now. We have just passed it. You can see there that we are at 7,000 meters per second. We need around 7,800 to get into a nice stable orbit. We are almost out of fuel here. Just a few more seconds of burn time here and then we are out. Come on. And there we go, periapsis height 105 kilometers. So we are just shy. Uh, actually, it will make a few orbits before uh, the stage two falls back into the atmosphere, but we can decouple our stage two here and just use our RCS just to get it up above the atmosphere, which is no problem. So I, I count that, I think that is perfectly fine. We were only out really by a few meters per second to get that periapsis right up there. So. This is fantastic and it does prove in my mind that the Falcon Heavy should indeed be able to push 30 ton to orbit. Uh, keep in mind that we had an extra 100 kilograms on our payload too. So just a little bit over that projected amount of mass to orbit. So this uh, would certainly account for just that tiny little discrepancy in our orbital velocity right there at the end. So seeing as we have achieved those milestones, there's no reason to stop now. Let's actually complete this mission and see if we can get this full payload here onto the moon's surface. What I've just done here is set up what's called a maneuver node to essentially project what time I need to start burning to actually meet up with the moon. So we're just going to switch on our lunar injection engine is what I'm going to call it. This is going to get our trajectory here most of the way up to the moon. We will need to ditch this stage and actually finalize our insertion here with our lunar lander. So you can see it's just about to empty out there. So we just need to ditch this. This is actually going to come back down and potentially fall back into the atmosphere. We'll switch on our landing engine there just to continue our burn, just to push ourselves up to intersect there with the moon. It's not a very large burn at all, only around 30 meters per second or so. And then I can set up what's called a mid-course correction to just do a slight adjustment as we're halfway to the moon. This is quite an efficient way to do it. We only need to sort of set up around 60 meters per second, and that's going to change our trajectory so that we're coming in around the moon 
on an equatorial orbit so that we can basically come down and land at any point on the equator of the moon that we want to. So as we leave the Earth here and watch it fall away from underneath us, we could just try to imagine how wonderful that view would be for those Apollo astronauts so many years ago. Well, that's of course unless you are a member of the Flat Earth Society, in which case you've probably already disliked this video and left a narky comment. So there's not much I can say about that. Anyway, so getting back to the mission, we are doing our mid-course correction burn just to bring us down around the equatorial plane of the moon there. So just finalizing that burn there, that's about perfect. And we can just again time warp in and uh, we'll now do a very small radial inburn just to bring our periapsis down there to around 400 kilometers from the surface. We just need to set up our circularization burn to drop ourselves into a nice orbit around the moon. And as we just come in here, as we fall into the moon, we can just check out the wonderful textures that are part of this real solar system pack uh, with realism overhaul that we're running here with Kerbal Space Program. Just amazing. And compared to the stock game, everything just looks so incredibly detailed. Of course, we are actually passing over the dark side of the moon, as it's quite often called, even though it's not always dark. Uh, what it is, though, is always facing away from the Earth, so we never get to see that side that we've just passed over. Uh, so yes, quite a nice way to experience that in this simulation. Just doing our retrograde burn here, we need to wipe off another 600 meters per second to circularize down around the moon. And that's going to then give us a good base to work from. What we'll actually do after that is time warp until the moon is actually on the opposite side of the Earth, just so that we've got direct communication with the Earth while being in full daylight. Uh, it's quite handy to wait until the phase of the moon is just right for more direct communication. Otherwise, we'd need to have satellites and that sort of thing around the moon to communicate if we were on the opposite side of it facing away from the Earth, which would be no good. So we're just finalizing that circularization there now and kick in this time warp. You can see there at around 1500 meters per second or so, it takes 27 days for the moon to do a full orbit of the Earth there. So given that we were on the opposite side of the orbit to where we wanted to be, we really need to wait around 15 days or so, 14 days until we are in the right spot to communicate directly and have that full sunlight. So we're just uh, coming up here to time now, we're going to do a slight retrograde burn at apoapsis to drop our periapsis down just above the surface of the moon. Bringing this down here, our aim is to land in a similar location to many of the Apollo missions. In fact, we're going to aim for down somewhere around where Apollo 11 first landed. Oh, we'll try to get close to that, I'm not being too accurate. What we do here is another slight retrograde burn just to drop the periapsis down into a negative altitude so that we're getting closer and closer to the surface as we pass over the top of the landing site. So the little engine that we have on this vessel is only really very weak. Even with the moon's gravity, it still is a little tricky to touch down successfully. Now we're currently in an orbit between 33 kilometers and 42 kilometers. We're going to bring this right down over the landing site as we're decelerating and basically what we need to do is slightly pitch up so that we don't begin falling too fast as we ascend down. We need those landing legs out of course so out they come there. We've uh, retracted the solar panels just to get them out of the way while we touch down. They can come back out when we're down on the surface. We have quite a large battery which will keep a few days worth of storage so more than enough to touch down before we need to recharge those. We're now down under 1,000 meters per second on our surface speed there. You can see just slightly pitching up there just to keep ourselves falling too quickly. What we want to do is reduce all of our horizontal velocity or most of it so that that leaves us to just drop gracefully down onto the surface. We can do a very small suicide burn just at the end there just to get our touch down quite accurate. I just skipped through a lot of that footage just so you didn't have to watch that entire full burn. As we get close to the surface here, we're just going to uh, kick in that final little landing burn. Just a touch down there, nice and gently. There we go, our lunar lander there on the surface 
of the moon. This is going to be our little starting base of operations, our emergency supply of food, water, and we even have a few other little surprises on this vessel. So we'll just uh, extend those solar panels out as we've just done there. And you'll see on the bottom here, we have these cool little inflatable safety bubbles, which we can just pop out to show you what they look like. They're on their side. Obviously, uh, a human would take those off and place them on the ground if they needed them. I'll just quickly boost up the lighting there. So we have over 1,200 kilograms of supplies there, food and water together, so it would keep several people alive for well over 100 days, I would think, just with those supplies there. The next thing I am going to be attempting to do on this channel, however, is actually do a fully expendable mission to the moon's surface with the Falcon Heavy. It is stated that the Falcon Heavy, in its fully expendable form, is able to get over 60 tonne to low Earth orbit. So that is another cool test that we can try next time. Please do subscribe to check out that next mission as it comes out. Before we go today, however, I will show a little blooper from a pretty darn hard uh, drone ship landing, which was quite interesting. So uh, yeah, just uh, didn't quite calculate the uh, landing burn quite correctly. And uh, yes, that's uh, that was the result of that. I've never seen a drone ship do that before. If only they were that robust in real life, SpaceX would probably have much less maintenance costs on those things. Hope you enjoyed that video. Please take a second, hit that like or dislike button if you didn't like it. All your support is incredible. If you have any questions for me, whack them in the comments below. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have the Falcon Heavy launch with the Tesla Roadster. The top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, a video that YouTube has chosen just for you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.